The Gospel of Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. The word of the Lord. My favorite teen bop is the clean version of Olivia Rodrigo's song, Driver's License. Any of you know that song? Yeah, we're the wrong demographic. So uh, she's a teen sensation. But, uh, but I've listened to this song while I've driven in my car many times with none of my girls there with me. So just picture this, this middle-aged man driving an F-150 with no other women in the truck listening to driver's license. It's the ultimate girl dad move. I've looked at videos of Rodrigo in concert performing this song. And the audience, which is mostly young girls, is going insane. Uh, I mean, they're not passive participants. You know, like you and I might watch a uh, documentary on how ore is extracted from the earth. No, no, they're fully immersed in the music, in the lyrics. You know, just take one line from the song. Uh, it says, uh, and I know we weren't perfect, but I've never felt this way for no one. Girls don't look at that line and go, the grammar is off. It should say, but I've never felt this way for anyone. Besides, Olivia needs some self-respect. She's giving way too much power to her ex. Oh, no. Girls sing that line like they wrote it themselves. Like they can see the face of the guy who slighted them. Like their soul has been in prison for a long, long time and has finally been released. Do you know what I'm talking about? This is what songs do to us. We live them. And it's not just young girls that do this. Oh, no. Go to a Garth Brooks concert. You'll see. And it's not just grown women either. Go to a Foo Fighters concert. This is what we do with songs. Well, our text of scripture today is a song. It's a lyrical piece. It's a well-known hymn. It's called the Magnificat. It's a song of praise on Mary's lips as she begins to reflect with Elizabeth on the wonderful things that God is doing in her life and in the world. And because the text of Scripture is a song, it invites us to make it our own. We don't just read it and say, oh, how nice that Mary felt that way. No, we enter into the song. We enter into the story the song tells. We use this story to help us reenact the thrill of wonder that touched the earth when Jesus was born. And to place ourselves in the story. We're continuing our series, All Things New, and today we're going to look at new power. Some things await the return of Christ before they're made completely new. Things like war, sickness, poverty, injustice, death. But other things Jesus brought and made new for his followers the first time he came. We don't have to wait until his return to have them. And some of those things is what we're focusing on this Advent season. And so last week we began with joy. The new joy that is ours when Christ is our all. Today we're looking at power. The new power of the kingdom. What we're going to see is that true power comes from magnifying God. True power comes from magnifying God. This text, this song is called the Magnificat which is a Latin word that means magnifies because it's the first word out of Mary's mouth, both in Latin and in Greek. It's a great opening line. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And so we're going to look at the need to magnify the Lord, the reasons to magnify the Lord, and the result of magnifying 
the Lord. Let's begin with the need to magnify the Lord. We're in Luke chapter 1, verse 46. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Now, remember what's happened so far in the Gospel of Luke. God dispatched the angel Gabriel to come and announce the birth of John the Baptist. But also, you know, he was going to be the forerunner to the Messiah Jesus. He was also a relative of Christ and to announce the birth of Jesus. But not just his birth, but also his conception by the Holy Spirit of God without any male seed. And so Gabriel comes to Zechariah, who was Elizabeth's husband. And although she was older and barren, she was going to become the mother of John. And then six months later, he comes to Mary and announces to her that she also is going to become pregnant by the Spirit of God. And Mary received these news, these words, with, with great faith. And without delay, she goes and she pays a visit to Elizabeth. And when they greet each other, remember, their wombs hold the fulfillment of centuries of God's promises to his people for the good of the world. And so when they greet each other, Elizabeth begins freestyling, or I should say spirit styling, because she goes, you know, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And then she says, as soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb, so little John, leaped for joy. So that's where we were last week. And when Mary hears Elizabeth's words, Mary herself begins to praise God. Now, let's go back to look at what Gabriel actually said to Mary, because you know she did not forget one word. In fact, she was most likely the one that many, many years later told Luke what had happened so that it could be recorded here in the gospel for our benefit. Mary was a virgin. She'd never been with a man, but she was engaged to Joseph. And so Gabriel comes to her and says, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was stunned by this greeting from the angel, as any of us would be. And so the angel says, don't be afraid. You found favor with God. You're going to conceive and give birth to a son, and you shall call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And then Gabriel says, the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. End. Okay, pause there for a second. Do you, are you grasping what Gabriel is saying to Mary? He's saying to her that his baby she's going to have in her womb is going to inherit the throne of David. God is going to give him the throne of David, and he's going to rule over God's people forever. His kingdom will never end. Just try to put yourself in her place into the story. But as wonderful as those words and promises are, that's now where Mary trips up. No, what she asks the angel is, um, how is this going to happen since I've never been with a man? And so Gabriel says to her, the Holy Spirit of you is going to come over you and the power of the Most High is going to overshadow you. And so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. So these are the words. These are the promises that Mary receives. And then she goes to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth confirms it by saying, you are the mother of my Lord. And while she's, you know, all these words are stirring in her soul, she begins this song of praise, and she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. Now, the NIV translation says glorifies. We read, my soul glorifies the Lord. To glorify someone and to magnify someone are similar ideas. That's a good translation, right? Uh, it, it, they, they refer to just about the same thing, although the word glorify translates a different Greek word. But what does it mean to magnify someone or something? It means to make it large, right? When you take a, a balloon, right, and you start blowing into a balloon, what are you doing? You're blowing it up. You're enlarging and you're magnifying it. That's what you're doing. Have you ever seen at a boy's birthday party or a girl's birthday party, all kinds of balloons hanging, dozens of them, all different colors, blue, purple, yellow, red, green, but they're all deflated. Have you ever seen this? They're just kind of hanging there, limp, sad, small. They haven't been blown up. 
No, you've never seen that. I hope you've never seen that because that's not what you do, right? No, for a balloon to do what it was designed to do, you have to blow it up. You have to enlarge it. You have to magnify it. Many people relate to Jesus like a deflated balloon. They haven't done the work to enlarge him, to magnify him in their lives. It's kind of like this tiny, sad little balloon in their pocket. No much power at all. That's what it means to magnify someone or something. Now, Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. So magnifying someone and joy go together. And I want you to, I don't want you to miss that. I want you to see that. Let's think about cars, for example. We love cars in Michigan, don't we? Well, say that you go to buy a car and you've been so excited about this. You've been looking forward to this for a long time. And so you, you, you start looking at them probably online. Then you go and you check them out in the lot and you look at the car, you inspect it well, but that's not all, is it? No, the salesman or the saleswoman, they know that to close the deal, what do they say to you? They say, take it for a spin. Why? Because they know that once you experience the, the power, the, the beauty, the comfort, the features of the speed of the car, something is going to start happening in your heart in relation to the car. Your attachment to the car is going to begin to grow because as you drive it, the car's hold on you will grow. And even if you don't buy it right then and there, you'll be thinking about it later on. What are you doing when you're thinking about the car? You're magnifying it. At one point, that car did not exist in your mind and heart. It occupied no space in your mind and heart. But now it occupies a lot of space. You're magnifying it. And once you buy it, you not only magnify the car, because that's what you're doing when you, when you start driving and you drive it with pride. You're so excited. You feel so safe. You feel so important. So you're magnifying the car and you're enjoying it. Do you see? Magnifying something and joy go together. So here's the thing. Here's what I want to submit to you. All of us magnify something. All of us make much of something or someone. And when it's not God that we're magnifying, our joy is going to be short-lived and we're going to feel powerless in the long run. So here's a question. How do we identify? How do you, because we all do this, we all magnify different things. How do you, how do I identify the thing that we magnify? Because it's not the same thing for all of us. So how? Well, there are a number of things you can do. There are a number of questions you can ask. What do you find yourself thinking about constantly? What is that? What's the thing that you would defend at all costs? What's the thing that if you lost it, you would feel like, what's the point of living? Without this, what's the point? What's the thing that maybe you hide? Or maybe you're willing to sin in order to get it or in order to protect it. All of these different questions are going to help you, are going are to give you insight into what it is that you magnify because we all do it. Let's take a couple of examples. A romantic relationship. Romance is a wonderful thing. I've been in a romantic relationship for a quarter century now and I'm loving it. It's so wonderful. It's a gift from God. But in a culture that does not believe in God, what we've done is we've taken our romantic pa uh, partner and we have expected them to give us the meaning, the purpose, the love that only God can give us. This is one of the reasons people have such trouble in their relationships or making their marriages work. Because no human being can do that for us. Imagine that you caught a fish. And you said to the fish, fish, I'm thirsty. Quench my thirst. Fish, I'm lonely. Talk to me. Fish, I feel small. Make me great. The fish can't do any of these things for you. At best, if you're hungry, the fish can make you full. Once, maybe twice. That's it. But see, this is what we've done with our romantic partners. We've said to them, I'm going to magnify you in my life. And in return, you're going to make me feel alive. You're going to make me whole. You're going to make me happy. You're going to fulfill my wildest dreams. 
And no human can do that for us. Nobody can. This is one of the big reasons that people have such a hard time making marriages and relationships work. Because we have loaded, we have overloaded our expectations of what a partner can do. Let's take our careers as another example. Our parents believe and we believe that our vocation is what makes us somebody. And so parents put a lot of pressure on their kids and kids and people put a lot of pressure on themselves because why? Because we have magnified the importance of our vocation, the importance of our career. And so rather than just seeing our vocation as a, a way of serving humanity for which we get a wage. No, our career is the measure, the measure of our intelligence and our worth. And so we're willing to sacrifice more important things for the sake of our career. We make all kinds of sacrifices. You know, it occupies way too big of a space in our lives. And if our career is not doing well, we don't simply just say, oh, I'll serve in another way. I just want to serve humanity. No, we feel like failures. Why? Because we've invested so much in the meaning of that vocation. We have magnified it. The examples could be multiplied. And maybe you're starting to think about your own things. But here's the point. As humans, we must magnify someone or something. We are not like animals who are simply just happy to be. They're just existing. That is not us. We are incapable of doing that. No, we must give our all into something. Maybe a person or a cause or a sport or an organization or a club or a whatever it may be. And we're seeking joy while we're doing it. And all of us are doing this all of the time. Do you know why? Because God created us to magnify him. And when we're not magnifying him, we're going to magnify something else because we must. It's how we've been made. It's how we're created. And when we don't magnify him, but magnify something else, our joy will be short lived and we will feel powerless. So that's the need to magnify the Lord. Let's look at the reasons to magnify the Lord because Mary received the news from Gabriel and then Elizabeth confirmed that news. And so her heart was just filling up with the Lord. And so she starts giving us the reasons that she's feeling so full by God. And so she goes on. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. Verse 48, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. So Mary is magnifying God because he has looked upon. He has been mindful of the lowly state of his Servant. Literally, the word is, he has looked upon her lowly state. God sees her. Mary's praising God because God sees her. Now, there's a lot of talk today about people wanting to be seen or people not feeling seen in a certain context. And so we do all kinds of things to get attention. Young people do it all, a lot on apps and social media platforms to get attention. But older people do it too in all kinds of other ways. And when we're not getting that attention, we feel dejected. But Jesus says, don't do things to be seen by others. He said, like, that's the opposite of what he says to, to do. He says, don't do things, even good things to be seen by others. Because why? Because your father in heaven sees in secret and he'll reward you. And so Mary, I mean, think about this. No one knows what's going on. Elizabeth does. Gabriel does, but he's not a human. And, and yet she's saying, God sees me. And that was such a comfort to her. And then she says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Think about this. She's barely received Gabriel's word. Elizabeth said to her, blessed are you among women. But now Mary's saying, all generations are going to call me blessed. Why is that? Well, think about this. If the baby that she's carrying in her womb is going to inherit the throne of David, and he's going to rule over God's people forever, and his kingdom will never come to an end, then for sure the mother of that Lord, the mother of that child, would be talked about for all generations. And here we are talking about her. 2,000 years later, probably all throughout the earth right now, people are talking about her. 
Now, there are parts of the Christian church that have done too much with Mary, right? In venerating Mary and worshiping Mary. And we don't have to do that. But we can acknowledge the exalted place that God gave her as the mother of our Lord. And then he says, she says, for the mighty one, the mighty one has done great things for me. So now Mary is honing in on the source of her power. Remember, that's what we're looking at today. New power. She says the mighty one. She's thinking about God, but she's thinking specifically about the might of God, the power of God, what the mighty one has done for his lowly servant. I mean, think about her. She's a young girl. She's not a man in a patriarchal society. She is with child and she's not married. Not yet. Just think of the questions that would start coming. She's poor. We know she's poor because months later when Jesus is born, Joseph and Mary go to the temple to offer the sacrifice for their firstborn. And they offer what the law prescribed for poor people to give. Not a lamb, but a pair of doves and two pigeons. Because that's all that a poor person could afford. And that's what they offer. So she's poor. She doesn't hold high office of any kind. She's not a scholar or a learned person. And yet, none of this matters. None of this matters to her because she says, the mighty one, the mighty one has done great things for me. You see, the focus is on God. The focus is on God and what he has done. Verse 50, she goes on. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. So now Mary begins to turn outward, right? She began talking about herself and what God has done for her. But now she starts looking outward to God's interactions with humanity. And she offers this contrast between those who fear God and those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. And she says that God extends mercy to the, those who fear him, but he scatters the proud. Who are the proud? Well, the proud are people who are self-assured, self-sufficient. They look down on others. They don't believe in God. They don't fear God. But there's also proud people who do believe in God. But they still don't fear him. Because you see, religion will only do you good to the degree that you have experienced the grace and mercy of God. And you know that the only reason you've been saved and the only reason you stand is because of the mercy of God. And that alone. Listen, the Bible is full of people who are religious and proud. And it's a sobering thought because Jesus says that he will not recognize one of them on the last day, even though they called him Lord in this life. We got to think about this because to the degree that we have religion in us, we need to ask ourselves, well, do I have religion, but I am proud? Am I proud or do I truly fear the Lord? Mary says God has performed mighty deeds with his arm. So again, she comes back to this theme of God's strength, his might, because the arm of the Lord is a symbol of his strength, his strength to save. In Exodus, which is such a monumental book in the history of Israel, we hear that God took Israel out of Egypt when they were slaves by an outstretched arm. In other words, God was flexing his power and he wanted the entire world to know it. And so she's, she's thinking about the power of God. She's thinking about the strength of God. Verse 52. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. So here there's a couple of other reversals, right? She says that those who are in thrones, rulers, God's bringing down while lifting up the humble. She says that he's filling the poor with good things while sending the rich away empty. Now, a quick note there about the rich. Because we're reading this text and we live in the richest country in the world. The majority of God's resources are still in America. And we live in rich neighborhoods. Uh, so we, we have a lot of means. And we, have, we can't just look at a, a verse like that and be like, oh man, those rich people. It's like, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, what? Because it says here that he sends the rich away empty. So how does this work? Well, does it mean that every rich person God sends away empty because they are proud in their hearts and they don't fear him? No, it does not mean that. 
But the correlation is high in Scripture between those of means, people who are rich, who have done well in life, and those who do not fear God, who are proud in their inner, innermost thoughts, and therefore who have nothing to do with God. The correlation is high. Why? Because they start magnifying their riches. We start magnifying ourselves for those riches, for doing so well. We may not say it like that. Oh, I've done so well. Can you believe it? We don't say that. Oh, but we feel it. We feel it deeply. And you cannot magnify money and God. But Mary says, he takes down, he brings down rulers from their thrones and lifts the humble. The cry of the human heart down throughout history has always been for those who are in power and who are oppressive to come down. And here's the thing, one by one, they all come down. One by one. It may not be as fast as you and I would like. Oh, but every single one of them comes down for, from their thrones except Mary's child. Except Mary's child of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Isn't that amazing? But what's so incredible about Mary's confession is that she knows God has done this. God has done it. So often we feel like we have to take matters into our own hands or things are not going to change. Right? But here's Mary, barely pregnant with the Son of God, saying... God takes down rulers. He lifts the humble. God sends the rich away empty. He fills the poor with good things. Verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. So she began by speaking of herself, the servant of the Lord, and finishes by speaking of Israel, the servant of God. You see, Mary understands that this is not about her in the least. No, this is about God. This is about God's faithfulness to his people, beginning with Abraham all the way down to his descendants. We sang some great songs about this very history today. But you see, at this time when Mary's alive, Israel, the people of God, are under the oppressive rule, the imperial power of Rome. Just think of Rome with all their conquest of many nations and their mighty military and all their Caesars and all their building projects. I mean, it's just power and riches and, and, and prestige and all of this. And yet Mary, here's young, single, pregnant Mary with no military or political or economic strength, power at all, and just by faith, she affirms that God is good to his promises. That God is good to his people. That God will fulfill what he has promised his people he will do. And she believes that the baby in her womb is the answer. So these are some of the reasons that she's magnifying the Lord. And so let's look now at the result. The result of magnifying the Lord. What is the result? Now, we've already looked at the result, actually. But just so we don't miss it, let's rehearse it one more time. So here's Mary. She's received the words from Gabriel. And she's contemplating this. She goes to Elizabeth. And she also confirms what's happening. And so she begins to magnify the Lord. She's Even though barely anything has changed in her life. She's barely pregnant. She has more questions than answers for the road ahead, but she has the word of God with her and she's holding on to that word. And so in that space of her being filled with the greatness of God, what is the result? Her perspective. Her perspective on life is wholly consumed with who God is and what God has done and what God is doing. It's all about him. It's all about him. This is not about her at all. Even that statement where she says, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. That's not about her. She says right after that, for the mighty one, the mighty one has done great things for me. She knows this is all the doing of God. I mean, she did not do much at all. I mean, at all. Except receive. 
receive the word of God, which is the same thing that we are to do today if we're going to have the power of God, if we're going to be part of God's family. And so her whole perspective is focused on God. All the verbs, all, the subject of all the verbs in this song is God. Right after she tells us that she magnifies the Lord, that's a verb, that's something she's doing, and her soul rejoices, that's also a verb, something she's doing. But after that, they're all God. It's what God is doing. God has looked upon her with favor. God extends his mercy to those who fear him. God has done mighty things for her. God has done, has done mighty things with his arm. God takes down rulers and lives the humble. God sends away the rich empty, but fills the poor with good things. God helps Israel and remembers his covenant with his people. Do you see? It's all about who God is. That's what has changed for her. And the result of magnifying the Lord is that we do not feel the urge to take matters into our own hands because we trust that God has us. That's true power. True power comes from magnifying God. The reason so often we go through life angry, insecure, anxious, is because God is small. He's tiny. He's like this deflated balloon that we can put in our pocket. And he's so powerless. God is the greatest being in the entire universe. We know this. But if we do not magnify him, if we magnify all kinds of other things, then God will have no power in our lives. I bank with Bank of America. And so for years now on their website, I've been seeing their slogan. You know their slogan? What would you like the power to do? So I've seen this all, every time I log in. It's like, what would you like? And I'm like, hmm, what would I like the power to do? But you see their point? Their point is we have money. We're a bank. And money gives you power to do whatever you want. And that's why we love power. Because power means I can do whatever I want. Power makes me significant. Power makes me great. But when you come into the kingdom of God, into God's way of doing life, power is something not that you have. Power is something that God has. Your power is trusting that God has the power. Jesus says, whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great. Great in the kingdom of heaven. You see, Jesus knows our need to be great. He knows this is the deepest desire of your heart, of my heart, is this need to be great, this need for significance, this need for that we matter. So he doesn't come and say, say to us or says to us, uh, you should not want to be great. Jesus does not say that. What he says is you should want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. See, what he says to us is you have a choice. You can choose to be great in the world or you can choose to be great in God's kingdom. In the world, it's all about your power. In God's kingdom, it's all about God's power. You see, our world is locked. It's locked in a struggle for power. It's all in our learning institutions, in our political discourse, in our places of work. We're lo locked in this view of a, a struggle between the powerful and the powerless. And you can cut this across races or genders or economics. And certainly there are injustices that must be remedied. The whole Bible is full of this for sure. But the whole discourse is all about the powerful and the powerless and the struggle against each other and how the powerless must take power from the powerful because they are the evil ones. Not realizing the inherent contradiction that when the powerless become the powerful, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed whatsoever. All we have is a new class of evil people. And the same cycle, the vicious cycle of violence and struggle for power and oppression just repeats itself. And this is what humans have been doing to each other since Adam and Eve left the garden and lost God. The gospel, the gospel is glorious because the gospel 
takes us out of this vicious power cycle into the kingdom of God. It's what it does. It frees us from feeling that we have to participate in this very thing. And it releases us into the kingdom of God. Have you ever played Monopoly? Imagine that you're playing Monopoly, but you're losing the game. You don't own Boardwalk or Park Place. You don't own any of the red or orange properties. Your cash is low. Things are bleak. And as often happens when you're playing Monopoly, fights break out. I was talking to people after the first sermon. They're like, oh, yeah, in our family. I mean, this is one of the reasons that Monopoly is banned in our family. Okay, it's just too much temptation here. But imagine now that you are playing Monopoly and you are losing, but in real life, you're doing really well. You own all kinds of properties. You own all kinds of beautiful buildings in expensive lots in thriving cities. And your cash position is strong. So you're playing the game and you're losing but you're not that bothered by Monopoly because, you know, so what I'm losing? It's a game. I'm doing well where it really matters. That's what the gospel does. But it doesn't take us from Monopoly to the real world. It takes us from the world to the kingdom of God. That's what it does. And when you step into the kingdom of God, into God's way of doing things, the things that matter so much to you before in the world do not matter anymore. They just don't. Have you ever tried to take Monopoly money? Have you ever tried to take Monopoly money, thousands of Monopoly dollars to buy your whatever Tesla or whatever you're wanting to buy? They would laugh. They would laugh in your face. You're insane. That's what we do. That's what we're doing when we try to take the values of this world into the kingdom of God. When we take the world's approach to power into the kingdom of God, it does not work. And so ask yourself, where does your power come from? Where does your power come from? Does it come from the control? Whatever control you're able to give yourself in your marriage, in your parenting, in your job, where does your power come from? Does it come from your financial security and stability and how well you've done? Does it come from your sexual appeal and beauty? Does it come from your popularity? Where does your power come from? Because we all are seeking power. Does it come from your knowledge, your learning, your education, your experience? Does it come from your religious performance, your overall goodness? Where does it come from? Church, listen, it's monopoly money. It's what it is. It's monopoly money. And where, whatever your source of power is, that's what you magnify with your life. Can we praise God for giving us a new source of power? He's given us a new source of power. We don't have to play that game, that vicious, deadly game. We don't have to. This is why we celebrate Christmas, because the birth of Jesus brings and has brought a new kind of power to earth, the power of God, the power of God's love that sent his son into a world that is blinded by, by power, a world that oppressed and violently killed his son. But out of that death, out of that love, Jesus emerged, wielding a new kind of power, the power of the cross, the power of the cross, the power of his life given for us. Please don't forget this. It's the power of the cross. It's that power, the power of his love for us that empties us of our love of power. It melts our hearts, and it's the only thing that can melt our hearts. It transforms us into people who do not have to take matters into our own hands. Oh no, we take them into God's hands because we know that he cares. We know that he's able. We know that he can handle them. His shoulders are broad. This is the power of the kingdom. Do you want this power? The power of the kingdom. True Power comes from magnifying God. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Oh, I know that for those who have come to you by faith, our deepest desire is to magnify you, to glorify you, to make much of you. 
And yet we struggle, God. We struggle magnifying all kinds of things, dead things, shiny things that to us feel so powerful. They have such a hold on us. And we, we feel so much happiness, so much joy magnifying them. Even people. The prospect of greatness in the eyes of many. We want to be seen. Seen by others. So desperately. Not realizing that you see us. You see us in our lowly state. And you come to us. Every one of us. And so I pray that you'd help us. To identify the things that we're magnifying in our lives and turn to you. Help us, oh God. Help us. Help us magnify you and rejoice in our God, our Savior. Help us make much of our Christ. The baby who was born to die for us. The one who had all power in the universe and made himself powerless, dying on that wretched cross to rescue us from our vicious affair with power, power that destroys, power that uses people rather than loves people. Thank you for the power of the cross. We love our Savior. We cling to him. We confess that only the power of the cross can empty us of our love of power. And we, we proclaim and affirm that true power is trusting that you have the power, God. In Christ's precious and strong name we pray. Amen.